Well, thank you, Archna and Andrew, for the invitation to speak on what I think is really a fascinating topic and very applicable for my practice right now. And I have no disclosures. So here are a few of the things that I'd like to touch upon in terms of objectives. Why are people starting to come in and ask us to not use mesh in their repair? And let me ask you guys, first of all, in the audience, how many people do tissue repairs? How many people do them routinely as your primary repair? So a very small number. So how many people use mesh routinely? How many people would feel comfortable if a patient came in and asked them to do a non-mesh repair? Okay, all right, good. So, where I live in Northern Virginia, we have an interesting patient population, and there is, as you would expect, in the seat of federal government in a high-tech area, a lot of really well-educated patients. We have NIH scientists, I have occasionally somebody who comes in with a lit search. But um, we have, a, you know, some patients who have no interest in discussing it. But why are more people starting to become aware of mesh? Well, a simple Google search here on mesh injuries, and I don't know if you can read that, but in half a second, there were 21 million hits on the topic of mesh and mesh injury. And a quick YouTube search. I am not going to subject you guys to playing a lawyer commercial, okay? Like none of us need to watch that video. Anybody who watches TV has seen that often enough. But from just the first page that pops up when you type in mesh lawyer, you get a lot of hits, right? So some of those law firms have really interesting websites. And some of them actually are well written if you go and look through. And they will actually send you to links like to the FDA and to the MOD database to look at the registries that we have for injuries with mesh. So a patient who's really researching this will get led to the medical device recalls page. And if you go through this, some of, some of them are, are kind of silly, they're sterilization errors, but as you know, there are some pretty significant recalls that have gone through. And just like we can, patients can go through and, and read about what the different um, incidents were that were record, reported and, and what's been um, taken off the market. So again, if you look at hernia mesh complications, so you're a patient out there, you're doing due diligence on going in to have an operation. I don't know about you guys, but when I get on Amazon, I can barely buy like a new water bottle because you're reading all the one star reviews and you're sitting there going, oh my God, well, you know, 60 people gave this one five stars, but 40 people gave this one this many stars and y you can psych yourself out of purchases. So. If you're doing the same thing for an operation, you can only imagine how complicated it is as a patient facing this amount of information that is available on the internet in seconds. How do you sort through that? How do you decide what's real and, and what's not? So when you keep going and you dig around some more, you start finding patient advocacy pages online. So people who have had problems with mesh are now very vocal and they are reaching out and doing a lot of outreach. So you can see here, this is one page I found where they are actually now having a patient health congress in Washington DC this September in, in my place of residence. So the patients are now starting to have their own academic meetings. And you know, it's not surprising, they are putting out online publications that look a lot like ours. And listing people we know well as resources to go and talk to. So it's, um, it's a lot more information that's really readily available. And speaking of patients and patient advocacy, I don't know if anyone here knows Bruce Rosenberg, but um, I learned of him a while ago because he and Bruce Ramshaw, who was my mentor have communicated quite a bit and Bruce has started attending Hernia Society. He actually got up and asked some questions in our mesh session this year, but he has formed something called the National Meshoma Foundation. 
and they don't have a website, so it's kind of tough for me to decide exactly what he's doing with it, but I think he's trying to help other patients who have chronic pain and, and feel really helpless. And, and I think we all know there are patients out there who get rebuffed by their operating surgeon and, and really feel like they have no place to go. People don't want to touch them. Here's one of our publications. We're starting to have these discussions. So this was just this January, um, a, a written debate between Dr. Ben David from the Shoulders Clinic and Dr. Veller from Tennessee on whether to implant mesh in patients. So that's the discussion we're having here today. Some of our discussions aren't quite as polite, I think, as, uh, although it was a little sassy, the interaction between uh, Dr. Ben David and Dr. Veller, what I chose not to put up is some of the interactions I've seen on Twitter and online between different surgeons, uh, which can be pretty inflammatory, and anybody who's searching those hashtags can see it. So we're fighting each other in public as well on some of these topics. So what do we know? We know that a foreign material is always going to cause an inflammatory response. It is. That's what our bodies are designed for. The intensity of that response, the location of it, the adjacent structures like nerves and potential bacterial colonization are what's going to lead to complications from the use of mesh. And just as a quick story, here is a patient who, within the past month, came to my office requesting a repair without mesh. So I think everybody can very clearly see the large direct hernia there with, you know, it was a two and a half, almost three centimeter mouth. But what you didn't see on that slide, but you see on the coronals here, let's see, do I have a mouse? I don't. Uh, but hopefully, oh, sorry. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you. Is it active? Okay. This sinus tract here, so she has a little tiny opening draining through her skin. So this patient's story is that in 2006, she had a plug-in patch, was doing fine until three years later, she had a pretty terrible motor vehicle accident. She wound up needing to have long-term care, which included things like a trach and a peg, and she did well. She got better, she rehabbed, but in 2012, she started having pain in her left groin. And she was evaluated by several surgeons I know well who said, oh, you're okay. They got some imaging. It was a little thick. They got radiology to do a biopsy, and nothing came out of it. But she eventually was found to have this collection in her groin, which was drained. And she's underwent several procedures by several different experienced surgeons to remove the foreign material from her groin. So now she comes to see me with inguinodynia a draining sinus, which suggests that despite two people being in there before, there's still foreign material. No one dictated taking out her plug, so I'm not sure if it's still there. And a big direct hernia. And I don't blame her for coming to me and saying, I want you to fix me, but I don't want you to use mesh. So we have direct to consumer advertising for non-mesh repairs. Another patient came to see me with a large direct hernia, and he asked me to do a DeSarda repair. And I told him, I have never done a DeSarda repair. He said, well, here, I brought you the papers, and here's his website, so look it up. He's got videos, watch them, and then I'll come back and talk to you, and you can do the DeSarda repair for me. So we'll talk about what I advised him at the end of the talk. But this is, you know, the information Dr. DeSarda has on his website. Here's how his repair is good, and here's the other tissue repairs, which are, you know, not as good as his. He's addressing it directly, you know, and we have the Shouldice folks who say Shouldice is the best. We have Dr. DeSarda who said this is the best. So again, if you're a patient who's interested in a non-mesh repair, are you going to go to this beautiful location for a three-day stay in, in the country in, in Ontario, or what are you going to do? So let's look historically back at our non-mesh repairs. We had the Bassini, the McVeigh, the Shouldice, now we have the DeSarda. And all of them involve sewing layers together, right? We call it a tension repair because we're bringing tissue across to cover a hole. And when we study them as, as residents, or even now, we're looking at pictures like this, trying to decipher what the hell's going where and which layer's going to what. And I don't think I'm the only one in the room who's been in an open groin saying, 
I've got no freaking clue what layer this is because it's just blown out to there. So you think about these pretty pictures and you're like, okay, I'll do the best I can, but this is not gonna look like the textbook. So is there any data to guide us besides that data? Yes and no. So what I'm choosing to show you here is the results of large randomized trials because it's tough to trust a small 50 patient study. Yes, in those studies we can kind of follow people more closely, but it's really through, I think, the aggregation of data we get a better idea. But of course, these studies have their limitations. You have heter uh, heterozygosity, you know, you're not always comparing like to like. But in this study out of the Netherlands, it was a multi-center randomized trial between open inguinal repairs with and without mesh. They had an, a decent three-year adequate follow-up and it being a closed system, they had good tracking of their patients. And you can see that about half of the repairs that they did open tissue were Bassini McVeigh, and then about a quarter were Shouldice, and the rest were a mix. And their Lichtenstein repair was a proline or Marlex seven and a half by 15 centimeter mesh. So they um, had 88% of their patients examined at three years, which is pretty good. And they found nine recurrences in the tissue repairs. And the one patient who recurred in the mesh group had accidentally had an absorbable mesh implanted. So that one's a tough call. So they're, they're looking at, you know, a 7% a versus 1% recurrence rate. And in another meta-analysis based off the EU trialists, it was pretty similar. They had 62 co relevant comparisons. And what they found is that, that out of 31 studies, 21 of them demonstrated decreased odds recurrence using mesh. So a lot of patients, thousands and thousands of patients that they compiled, and the non-mesh repairs had twice the rate of recurrence as the mesh repairs. And you can see the uh, odds ratio uh, scatter plots. Another thing to keep in mind, as we all know, the rate of hernia recurrence increases steadily with time. So any study where you're only following somebody for a year is just not going to give you a clear picture of what true recurrence is. To try to look at these different types of repairs, it's tough. And some papers attempt to put it together. You know, I think for the tension-free results, that looks pretty good, 0 to 1.7%. But they're giving a 0 to 1.6% plug repair rate. And I know that I fix people with recurrent plug repairs all the time. So it's, it's tough to trust that this data is really accurate. But there's some more um, randomized or, or, or meta-analysis studies. So Cochrane has two different ones. In this first study, you can see that mesh reduced recurrence by 50 to 75% with a good odds ratio of 0.37. And in a second study, comparing Shouldice versus primary repairs and Shouldice versus mesh repairs, that uh, in the case of a Shouldice versus mesh, there clearly was uh, a benefit using the mesh, but if you compared the Shouldice to the other primary repairs, there was the benefit with using the Shouldice repair. So what about the Shouldice repair? So I think we know that a lot of people are frustrated that they haven't been able to recreate the Shouldice results. And this is a very interesting study that um, David Erbach, who's one of our SAGE's um, strong members, was the chair, the, uh, one of the senior authors on. And they essentially, because of, of the health system in Ontario, they were able to track the uh, administrative data on all the patients who had inguinal hernias in Ontario. And they compared hospital, hospitals that they divided into quartiles based on their volume to the Shouldice Hospital. So you can see that the fourth quartile hospital, so the one with the highest volumes of hernia repairs, was still only about maybe a sixth of the number of repairs done at the Shouldice Clinic. And you can imagine a Shouldice is being done by a small cadre of surgeons. So something else that's interesting is who is the population being repaired at the Shouldice Clinic? Well, they had a higher income, they had lower comorbidities, and I'm told by friends who work in Canada that, um, and in Ontario, that they turn away a decent number of people who they deem not to be accurate for their repair. So we're looking at a very selective population for their tissue repair. 
But you can see in this study, they had excellent outcomes. There was a 1.2% recurrence rate with the shoal dice, whereas in a general hospital, it was a 48 to 5.2%. And those patients were admitted for several days postoperatively, which I think is not the practice of most American surgeons, so that's difficult to um, make applicable for us. And they had that very strict selection criteria, but a very large volume of the same procedure, and that's important. So Archana, this is for you. Blame Canada. For my Montrealer friend. All right, so I kind of think of the Shouldice surgeons as, as really being fellowship trained Shouldice surgeons. When they come in, if you look at their website, they're trained to assist for 50 operations and then they're supervised for 200 before they can do the operation. I mean, that's my fellowship, right? So this is what they do all the time. And I think it just reinforces what we all know. You do best what you do all the time. Just a quick word on the DeSarda. There's not a lot of data. There are a lot of papers floating around, but when someone attempted to do a meta-analysis on it, the 500 papers were quickly whittled down to eight for comparisons, and it had less than one year of follow-up. Um, so one recurrence in each group, I think that's difficult to say. When Dr. DeSarda presented his data, uh, he had no recurrences. It was great, right? But I think, I think most of us are skeptical of someone who's perfect. So you wonder exactly what's going on in the quarter of the patients who he was not able to follow up. So what am I going to do for this young lady who doesn't want to have mesh? And, and I don't blame her. You know, I think it's going to be an open approach to go in and try to clear out any more foreign material, and that's going to be a, a tough, big, direct hernia to close. Um, option one is to do the best tissue repair I can, which I know isn't the best operation in my hands because I do 99% laparoscopic surgery. Most of the time when I'm open, I'm taking mesh out but then you have to somehow put things back together. Should I give her a piece of biologic mesh? Well, we know with direct inguinal hernias that the rate of recurrence is much higher than with an indirect when you're using a biologic. But it could get me out of a sticky situation and maybe I could agree to her that if I feel like some buttressing is necessary, a dissolvable mesh would be acceptable to her. So those are some of the different options. And, and this is a tough case, it's a tough situation. How about my other patient, my patient who came in requesting the DeSarda repair, which I finally figured out was kind of a modified Halstead, where you bring down the upper edge of the external inguinal, of the external oblique and sew it to the inguinal ligament, and then you cut it and sew it down to the underlying external, and then you bring the new top edge to the old bottom edge of the external. It, it's confusing, and I was not going to practice or learn this repair on this patient, and I told him, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do your surgery. So I think you always have an option of declining because what I didn't wanna do is try it out in this patient and not have it work. Uh, it just, I think it's better to educate yourself in other ways. So in conclusion, you know, the landscape around us is really changing as both traditional media and social media are focusing on these issues. And there's so much information being disseminated. Some of it's good, some of it's not. Um, but patients are gonna self-refer themselves to us and ask for specific things and challenge us. They're gonna challenge us to defend our rationale for why we use mesh. And I think that it's okay to tell a patient that if they're asking you to do something you're not comfortable with, I'm sorry, let me help you find somebody else who might be willing to do this. But I think as most of us do use mesh, we, we are obviously not going to do a tissue repair as well as we do a mesh repair but we need something in our back pocket for those situations where it arises. Thank you.